Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to this first session of the afternoon, which is a regular talk that will last until 2 p.m. I kindly ask you before we start that if you need to leave the room, please be mindful of the events going on in the other rooms next to us. So please try to exit the room quietly and make sure to close the door. But now to our speaker for this session. With us, we have a true performance expert with 17 years of experience under the belt. Please give a warm welcome to Peter Dalder, who will be walking us through how to build for performance. A warm welcome. Thank you all for coming today. Um, as you might hear a little bit, uh, my voice is not exactly what it should be. Um, so uh, I hope that it lasts the entire session. Um, I won't be taking any shortcuts, uh, but maybe I need one of you to step in for me and do all the talking. Uh, but we'll see how, uh, how everything goes. Um, the title for this presentation uh, is Another Something First Framework and Let's Talk About Performance. Um, the idea behind this uh, is that we have a lot of frameworks when it comes to development. Uh, we have uh, accessibility first. Uh, we have, um, well, a couple of others as well, uh, slipping my mind, of course, right now. Um, but those are mostly focused on front end development, and we have barely nothing that is uh, more focused on the back end development. Um, I'm introducing a framework and methodology today. Um, you might have heard of it, you might have uh, understood or learned about parts of it in the past, uh, but I'm just going to easily uh, take you to, uh, through the entire process, um, a development cycle, so to say, uh, for websites, um, just to um, make, you, make you a little bit understand, maybe make you a bit curious about how this whole process goes. A uh, little bit about me as well, um, like it was said in the introduction, uh, over 15 years of experience in hosting, I'm currently working as a solutions engineer with the sales team at Surfbolt, a Norwegian hosting company. Um, usually I prefer to go bouldering, so, uh, climbing on a wall instead of just hanging out on a couch, and anytime coffee always beats tea. Um, so enough about me. Um, first. A very quick question for you people. What is performance? Or what is web performance? Any ideas? Anybody? In the back. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. That kind of makes sense. Any other sure. takers today? Speed? Yes, OK. So let's just keep it very simple. Um, we're focusing on the whole broad spectrum of uh, web performance, and that is it's a objective measurement and also the perceived user experience for a website or application. Um, you can build an application to be fast, it can still look slow to a user. Uh, you can make it look fast to the user while the application itself is still slow as hell. Um, so when we're talking about web performance um, in the way that we're talking about it right now, we're talking about the whole broad spectrum. So it's not just the performance of the application. It's not just how the user perceives it, just the entire package. Um, also wondering uh, how many of you people are um, developers? I see a lot of hands. Do we have any business owners? A few as well. Okay, so for the business owners, this is uh, something that you can implement with your development teams. Developers, this is something that you need to convince the business owner of that it's good to implement and just to get things going. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, so topic was, was is actually, it's performance first as a framework. Um, first question that always comes to mind is why is, uh, why this performance first framework? Um, I already did a short explanation, but there are a few key points to uh, keep in mind. Um, these are just four. Um, I can, of course, always come up with more, but we need to keep time a little bit limited. So by building a performant application, you will reduce the carbon footprint of your website, um, especially nowadays, that's a huge thing. Um, the end product that you're delivering, it's way better in quality. 
um, just because you're using a better quality code, which is more performance, uh, will give you a better end result. Your hosting costs, they might go down, or the hosting costs of your client, because your application all of a sudden doesn't need eight VPS cores. It can run on two. So that can help you scale that a little bit. Um, the last is um, one that might not be uh, instantaneously, uh, but you will also start to experience shorter development cycles. And that is because when we are currently developing, we're building a website, and after that, we're going to start working on the performance which means that when you're actually already having a finished product, you start dissecting it again and taking it apart. Why is this slow? Why is that slow? So that way, um, by combining that, uh, you will just shorter uh, the entire cycle. Um, that is, of course, profit for your boss or for yourself, depending on who's paying the bills. So how does this work? Um, it's a relatively simple five or six steps that you need to take during your entire uh, development process, your entire development cycle. Um, that's uh, if you take those steps each and every time that you're delivering a product or when you're building upgrades, um, everything will go faster. And um, by doing so, uh, eventually you will get better code. So, um, when we're talking about this uh, whole performance first, um, especially about this framework, um, we're keeping in mind two parts. Um, first one of those is your performance budget. Um, is anybody um, familiar with the term or terminology for a performance budget? I see one finger. A finger is still a Tom Bremkes. Ah, okay. So um, a performance budget is basically a budget that you set for yourself, uh, for your website or for your application, um, which is basically everything that you have to spend on that site. So uh, you can have a performance budget, say I want it to be within two seconds and I want a maximum page size of two megabytes, for example. Um, that's basically the budget that you're setting. The second part of uh, this whole thing is your performance testing. Because it's fun when you're setting a budget, but if you're not testing it, you don't know what you're actually doing. And with these two parts, we have one rule, and that one rule is to rule them all. And that is that your performance budget is absolute. So whatever you do, you are not allowed to go over the budget that you set for yourself at the beginning of your development cycles. Now, next up is the fun part. I'm going to do a quick rundown of how such a development cycle would, uh, would look. I'm just going over the steps one by one, uh, just showing you how this, uh, this can be done. Um, here we have the performance budget again. Um, for this specific example, taking just two factors, you can use more factors if you want. But these two are usually good enough to start with. And the first one is time. How many time or how many seconds can I spend? Do I want to load my website in two seconds? Do I want it to load in three seconds? What is the budget that I have time-wise? Now, the second constraint is my size. With, given my, uh, my time slot that I have, how many time do I have? How many uh, kilobytes or how many megabytes can I send in that same time frame? Now, these are um, a bit abstract. So for measurement, it's use, uh, usually useful to um, measure them using KPIs. Um, calling term KPI, anyone unfamiliar with that? Nobody? That's good. So given these two factors I've set up, or KPIs. The first one is an easy one, time to first byte. If I want a performant uh, website or a performant application, first thing to look at is time to first byte. The second one, total page size. Um, if you have a huge bloated website, that will affect the performance that your uh, visitors will be experiencing, so getting that down to a normal level is always a good thing. 
And then we have two more. That's the time for the DOM content to load and the time for fully loaded. They might not make direct sense in uh, this example with these two factors, but the reason I've added these two is that if you are doing this in an iterative way, uh, and you need to figure out why is my website suddenly going over my performance budget, you want to know what aspects of your website you're looking at. So time, to, uh, time for the DOM content to load, and the time for fully loaded are two aspects which really could capture that specific metric. So you can see, is my time to first byte, for example, increasing so much that I'm going over my budget, or is it something else in the process? So you know at least where to look in your code. The second step. That's the step that most developers like, uh, code and deploy. So you make your changes, you put them on a staging environment just to see what it does. This process will get easier over time. Because when you are uh, not just doing this once, but you're using the same code base and you're doing it again and again and again. In the end, what will happen is that your uh, code base that you have or parts of the code base that is being reused in different projects will become more optimized. So you don't have to don't do those optim optimizations again, so the whole process gets easier. It's just that simple. Um, the third step is to test our performance. And for that, we first need to determine what kind of scope do we need with the test that we are uh, running. So the first scope that we have is a function or a fraction of your code. For most use cases, the scope is completely useless. This is usually done somewhere in a CI pipeline and it doesn't need to be run on changes that you deploy to a live website because there are much better ways to measure that. First one being a single page. Um, this won't happen often because mostly when you deploy changes it will be something that has effect on the entire website. So just testing one page will not tell you how it will affect other pages. So if you do happen to have something that you're deploying on just one single page and you're 100% sure that no other parts of your code are being affected, then you can test a single page. Um, there are various online st online tools you can do for that. There you can you can r run for that. Um, it's very easy. You can even do it in the browser. Just uh, run some quick tests, get the KPIs that you want, and make your decision based on that. But in most cases, you will be running a full site uh, analysis. Um, you can use tools for that, uh, Screaming Frog, Sidebulb, uh, there are a couple of other tools as well. Um, if you want to go really fancy, get it into your CI pipeline, just as a final step, run a couple of tests for me and get me the results. You just set it up once, you don't have to do it again. It's very, 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 very ah, convenient, sorry. Um, then we get to the fourth step. That's a easy one, that's just a question. Did it affect performance? So whatever I did, I deployed my code. I've tested it, I've got a set of KPIs. I also have a set of KPIs for my last deployment. So what happened there? Did it get better? Did it get worse? And that one is also very easy to answer because that's not a grayscale question. That's just a very simple yes or no answer. Either it got faster or it got slower, or in most cases, it got slower. And that gives us a very nifty way of looking at what we should be doing here. So given the previous question, that is, did it affect performance? Um, in most cases, it will be yes, but we'll start at the bottom first because that's easier to follow. So we have deployed something and it did not affect my performance. Woohoo, I win. But did it increase my page size, for example? If it didn't, then the Third question, are you, over the, are you above the overall budget? Still should be no. So that means that we can deploy. We can put stuff live, that's good. Um, so, but what if it did increase the pace, page size? Then we need to start considering, is the changes that I'm making, uh, it increases my page size, is that worth it? In most cases it will be, in other cases it won't. But that's a decision that you as a developer should be making yourself. 
Um, is it worth it? Yes. Again, are you above the budget? Let's hope or not, because that means that we can deploy. If we are going over the budget, we need to start reworking, because we have one golden rule to live by, and that is that you can never exceed your performance budget. Um, so, say we answer the question we had with yes. So, performance was the fact that my performance is getting worse. Is that worth it? Again, it's a question you need to ask yourself. You need to make an, uh, an, an answer for yourself. Is it worth it? Yes. Are you over your budget? No. Perfect. Let's deploy. But again, if it's not worth it, you need to work, rework your code. And that does not mean that you need to rework the code that you've just added to your project. Because at some point, everybody will hit this limit. Um, if a change that you make, for example, makes you go over your time budget, that does not mean that that change itself is the factor that causes that. There might have been a change a half a year ago that added way more time and is much easier to fix than that small, perfect solution that you just implemented on the website that just tipped you over. So also keep in mind what part of my code can I refactor the quickest and the easiest to make sure that everything that I have grows to within my budget again. After that, we're up to the sixth and final step, and that is deploying to life and enabling caching. And why are we enabling the cache just now? Because everybody always tells me that I should have caching on my website, because that makes my website go fast. Mm, it doesn't. It makes it look fast. Caching is something that you always enable as a last and final step. Um, there are many, many hosting companies out there telling you exactly the opposite. If you want a performant website, you need caching, but you don't. What you need is performant code that works good and works fast. Once you have that, you can add caching to improve it even more, but don't rely on that cache for speed, because it will make you a very, very lazy developer. By using this method... method, bleh, method okay, so by using this framework, um, what you're basically doing is you're forcing yourself to improve your coding skills, to improve um, the quality of code you're producing. You're just making the whole product that you're building better in a way that you can't do if the first thing you do is enable caching, because you don't need to fix it. It's already fast. But there's one thing that's very, very, uh, very sure about caching, and that at some point in time, someone will not hit that cache. And if that happens, they won't have a performant website, because what's behind that caching layer is just slow as hell. So like I said, without cache, you're the one that needs to improve. And that's the only way to get better. Thank you. And thank you, Peter. So exciting talk, but do we have any questions for Peter? Show of hands and I will walk around the room and take you in order. Hi, <coughs> is it acceptable to have a different performance budget for different use cases? For example, yes. hmm, this is a big report page, let's they can wait longer because less people get to that page, but other pages can be fast because a lot of people come there all the time. Mm. So if you're um, just building one application, you will set one, uh, one performance budget for that. Um, but uh, just limiting yourself or increasing your performance budget just because there is not so many people there, uh, in my opinion, is the wrong decision to make. So. Of course, you're free to do so, but um, regardless, if you get 50 visitors a day or maybe 50 visitors per second, uh, you should have scalability available. Um, a colleague of mine did a presentation on WordCamp Netherlands a couple of months ago, 
uh, where he also showed a use case of a website that he helped develop uh, in his early days as a developer. Um, they were usually doing maybe 50, 100 visitors a day, so nothing wrong. But then the Dutch government used some of their data in one of their reports that got picked up by a local newspaper and all of a sudden they had thousands of visitors a day. And at that point, you're, if you still need to improve your code when your visitors are already peaking, you're too late. So it's always best to um, yeah, just keep the performance in mind, regardless whether you have five visitors or 50 or maybe 50,000. Does that answer the question? If you have such a big peak, because we also struggle with it, we have like uh, sometimes many visitors in one peak, mm -hmm. short moment of time. Isn't it impossible to 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 code against that? Do you need more like horizontal scaling or something to add capacity to your server instead of of, of uh, um, that would really depend on the kind of traffic that you're getting hit with. Um, but I don't think that doing a uh, traffic analysis on this specific case would be beneficial for the rest of the audience. But hit me up right after this talk and we can talk about it. I believe I saw a hand somewhere over there as well. Questions, anyone? Anyone? tools do you use for testing for example spot for testing yeah uh, what kind of testing uh, you told some so, some tools you you mentioned but I'm ah yes for the uh, site analysis uh, that would be sidebulb sidebulb um, screaming frog or you could implement it in your CI pipeline yeah so the continuous inter the continuous integration pipeline uh, in your development process if you don't have it, look it up. It's really interesting. It can save you lots of headaches and do lots of automated stuff for you. Thank you. Um, how can I check that the budget that we have is determined is okay or if it's like, how do I know if it's too large or too, too low? Or... Um, so the performance budget that you have um, should be set up by someone that uh, knows what goals you want to achieve with your website. Um, for example, many clients we have, uh, they just run online tests to see how their website is performing. Uh, so just PageSpeed Insights, uh, things like that. Um, they will already give you certain numbers, like what is good, what is not good. Based on that, you can make an analysis for yourself, like, well, okay, two seconds, well, it works for me. Or you can be uh, optimistic and you say, well, I want to improve, so I'm put, put, putting it down to one second. The same goes for the total amount of data you're sending. Okay, so it really depends on who we're serving, who we are, how we want to present yeah. ourselves. It's a, yeah. kind of like a subjective yeah, it's, goal, it's, right? Yeah, it's not, um, it's not set in stone somewhere. Like, it's uh, not if you're having a performance budget, this is what it should be. It's always on a case-by-case -case basis, something that uh, the development team needs to figure out for themselves. Like, what are the goals that you're setting for this specific project? Thank you. Any more questions? Don't be afraid. My voice is still working, so. Right, I have one. Awesome. So we're both in the web hosting industry and as a fellow web hoster, I would like to know how web hosting companies can accommodate your framework and similar goals. Don't set limitations. Um, what we see a lot is that uh, hosting companies are setting limitations uh, that would uh, basically force you to hire plans as soon as you're hitting a lot of traffic in at the same time. Um, it doesn't really help with the framework itself. Um, but it does allow you to um, make more use of the performance that you have available. Um, specifically to the framework itself, um, it would really help if a hosting company has GitHub integration, stuff like that. So you can connect your own CI pipeline uh, to your hosting environment. And if you're uh, running tests, get deployed to a staging environment. Once you're done with that and it's all cool, 
you can automatically deploy to your live uh, live website. That's stuff that can really help. That was a very good answer. Do we have any more questions in the room? No more questions? Well, in this case, I will say thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. You're we welcome. have a small gift for you to thank you for your very interesting talk. Sweet. Thank and you.